Okay, welcome uh, everyone. We have uh, an exciting uh, set of presentations today. Um, we'll start with our own uh, Karim El Badri. He will tell us about uh, a black hole. The first one, I guess, uh, discovered uh, around normal star, no accretion, just Newtonian dynamics, which is something that we debunked for, for some years. But uh, he himself found an example that he cannot give up. Uh, and uh, then we'll hear from Jeremy Dietrich uh, and Nathan Safford, and finally from, again, uh, our own Mercedes, uh, that will tell us about exciting results from JWC. Corinne, please take it. Okay. Can, can people hear me? Yep. Okay, so this here is a picture of Zeta off, which is the nearest O star to the sun. Uh, it's not the main object I'll be talking about, but it just happens to be in the same part of the sky as the object I will talk about. I, it's the nearest O star, a distance of about 100 parsecs, about 20 solar masses, and it drives this fast wind, which is creating this beautiful bow shock that you can see here in a Spitzer image. So O stars like Zeta Oth are energetically very important for the galaxy, uh, but there aren't that many of them, and they're very short-lived. So we can see in the Milky Way today, there are something like 20,000 of them. You know, Basically, we can count them. Uh, typically, they live about 5 million years. And then after they end their lives, many of them turn into black holes. Uh, so if I want to know how many O stars there have ever been in the Milky Way, and thus maybe how many black holes there have ever been, I can just multiply that 20,000 by the ratio of the lifetime of the Milky Way to the lifetime of such a star, and I get you know, about four times 10 to the seven black holes should be in the Milky Way. And then if I account for the fact that the star formation rate hasn't been constant, I, I might end up with a number more like 10 to the eight, but it's pretty uncertain because we don't know exactly which stars turn into black holes. Okay, so 10 to the eight black holes, all right, where are all of them? All right, and you know, which ones do we know about? So first of all, we, there are about 20 confirmed black holes in X-ray binaries. Uh, most of these have been known for a long time. Most of them are black holes with with uh, faint low mass companions that are transferring mass onto the black hole by Roche lobe overflow in very close uh, binaries. And then a few similar systems that are a little bit wider with massive star companions. In addition, there are about uh, 50 X-ray sources that based on their X-ray properties we think are probably black holes, but we haven't been able to measure dynamical masses because they're too far away and too faint. Uh, so we can't get radial velocities for the companion stars. And you can see uh, from this uh, plot of number of black holes as a function of time, the kind where we can actually dynamically confirm them and measure their masses has basically plateaued in the last 20 years, because uh, we, we found the, the close ones. Uh, whereas the number of, of sources suspected to be black holes based on X-ray properties has been growing steadily. We usually detect them when they go into outbursts. Uh, and then just last year, uh, there was a, the first astrometric microlensing event from a black hole where uh, it seems like there's good evidence that a, an isolated black hole passed in front of a background star. So, you know, we have 71 plus or minus a few out of 10 to the 8. Uh, where are all the rest of them? Well, you know, they're black and they're small, so they're hard to find. Uh, one thing you might uh, think of how you could find them, right, almost all the ones we know are in binaries. And uh, most massive stars that turn into black holes are born in binaries. So something like 70% of the stars uh, we think uh, that eventually turn into black holes are born with one or more stellar companions. And so after the star turns into a black hole, in some cases the binary will be destroyed, but in some places, uh, in some cases they must stay bound. And in that case, can't you just look for stars that are orbiting something that you don't see that's massive? Uh, and use their radial velocities to infer the presence of a companion, just the same way we look for planets. Uh, so, you know, I, about four years ago, I started trying to do this. Uh, more than 50 years ago, other people started. Uh, actually, before the, even before the discovery of Cygnus X1, the first uh, black hole uh, known to be a, a black hole uh, in an X-ray binary, there were searches for these kind of objects. But they just didn't find any. We now know that the reason is that these kind of systems are pretty rare, and so you have to look at a large number of stars. Uh, I th we think now of order a million before we have a good chance of finding one. I'll talk about where that number comes from. 
Uh, but uh, fortunately, in the last few years, there have been these, these large-scale surveys of the Milky Way uh, that are getting photometry and spectra for millions of stars. And so it should actually be possible to do this. And the picture that has emerged is you can look. Uh, you may find something, but it's extremely difficult. And so here's just a, a summary slide of uh, you know, what the proposed candidates in the last five years or so have been. Uh, I have the, the names and then just uh, my personal verdict on what they are. So uh, red means certainly not a black hole. Orange means it could be. It's not ruled out, but I would bet against it. And then blue means you know, at least a 50% chance that it actually has a black hole. And then Sagittarius A star, we're pretty sure by now. Uh, so uh, there are many ways that these searches can go wrong. The most common one is when you have a mass transfer binary. Uh, and one of the components, the one that you can see, has a much lower mass than it looks like it should have based on its radius and temperature. So if you interpret it as a main sequence star, rather than a product of mass transfer, you'll overestimate its mass and then also overestimate the mass of the companion. Uh, and so uh, along with these objects, you know, I, I've been searching in radial velocity surveys and photometric surveys, and I found many different ways that don't work. Um, so uh, now for a way that might work, uh, the Gaia satellite is monitoring the positions of uh, something like 2 billion stars in the sky and measuring their astrometry. And until now, Gaia has fit every source with a single star solution, just assuming uh, that its motion on the sky is from proper motion and parallax alone. But in DR3, they first started fitting binary solutions, where they, they allow for the possibility that, like this, a source is wobbling because of an unseen companion. Uh, and in, just in DR3, which is the first data release of this kind, they publish about 170,000 astrometric binary solutions. Here you can see them on the CMD. They're mostly solar type stars. Um, this is a factor of thousands compared to previous astrometric binaries samples, but it's actually a factor of something like 50 increase over all previous literature that has uh, produced orbital solutions for binaries. Now, we know of many more binaries in this than eclipsing binaries, for example, but in cases where we actually know the orbit and can make an inference about the mass of the, com of the components, this is a total game changer. And so it's a good place to, to go and, and look for rare objects like stellar mass black holes. Uh, one of the difficulties is that Gaia doesn't actually publish the individual astrometric me uh, measurements at, from different epochs. They just publish their fit to the ellipse. Uh, and so uh, to convince ourselves that a source is real, we have to go do follow-up to get our own data. So I won't talk too much about how I decide exactly which objects to follow up. The short answer is you want to follow up a, uh, a lot of them. In most cases, when you select things that look like they have black hole mass companions, uh, you find something that looks like this. So the, the Gaia solution predicts that the radial velocity should be varying a lot, and you get some, radio, some actual measured RVs, and they don't match the solution. Uh, and that doesn't mean most Gaia orbits are wrong. Most of them are right. It's just when you select in tails of the distribution where there aren't many real objects, you can easily become dominated uh, by solutions that are wrong. Uh, so there was one object in DR3 uh, that uh, I'll talk about more. <laughs> that ended up being promising. What I'm plotting here is predictions for the way the radio velocity should change as a function of time from the orbital solution. Uh, the red points show two measurements that this source had from the LMOST survey a few years back. And right here, it looks like they don't match the data. But of course, the astrometric solution doesn't know the center of mass velocity. So I can adjust that to match the data. And I say, OK, it looks like they, they match the data. This source is real. But of course, just look based on the radial velocities, it could also be that the source isn't moving at all. Uh, so, uh, it's a, Shortly after DR3, I got uh, one spectrum of this source with MAGE on Magellan, uh, and there it is. So I got really excited here, because it looks like it's starting to move in the right direction, but of course it could still turn around. Uh, and I was happy that I had, right after this, I had more than three weeks of time on the small telescope at La Silla to follow it up, and I said, oh, I'll immediately be able to tell whether it's real or not. Uh, but then there was a blizzard <laughs> uh, immediately. <laughs> And so I lost all of my three weeks. Uh, and eventually I had to start asking other people to get me radial velocities as a favor. 
I uh, became very obsessed with this source. Uh, but eventually I got them, and they actually sit on top of the astrometric solution. Uh, and you know, here I'm just comparing them to the astrometric prediction, but I can include them in the fit to get a tighter solution. And when I do that, uh, I can get a very tight constraint on the mass of the dark companion. It's about 10 solar masses, plus or minus point, or 9.8 plus or minus 0.2, 480 parsecs away in a wide orbit of 186 days, which gives you a semi-major axis of about 1.4 AU. Uh, the star is, is in basically every way except its companion unremarkable. It's about uh, the mass and luminosity of the sun, close to solar metallicity. The spectrum, which is shown here and compared to a standard star spectrum, is indistinguishable from, from the spectrum of any random G star that you pull out of the disk. Um, I need another 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, the, the, the basic question we're working on is how do you form a system like this? So right now, the orbital separation is one and a half AU. The progenitor of the black hole, when it was a red supergiant, would have been much bigger than this. It's about uh, 10 AU. And so normally you would think this means the system went through an episode of common envelope. But that doesn't seem to work, because common envelope uh, it should bring the star into a very close orbit next to the helium core, like a few solar radii. And it should never get out afterward to as wide a separation as it is today. And so we think one possible formation scenario, may not be the only one, uh, is that instead it formed in a triple like this, and actually in the inside we don't have one 10 solar mass black hole, but rather two 5 solar mass black holes. The reason that's exciting is it's a testable, predict uh, testable scenario. For this star, we can measure extremely precise RVs at sort of the one meter per second level. And so if, in fact, there are two black holes there, we can detect uh, wiggles like this in the residuals. OK, uh, I'll leave you with my summary. There is another possibility that it was born in a cluster and uh, the black hole pre-existed and then it found the companion. Uh, and the, you know, there is also, obviously, the kick velocity that you expect. Uh, so can you maybe comment? By the way, I, I didn't realize that you're an observer. I thought it was a theory. <laughs> yeah, I didn't <laughs> tricked everybody. <laughs> yeah, so another idea is that it formed in a cluster and was an exchange. Uh, that's definitely not impossible. It's a little harder to test. Uh, because, you know, there's no evidence of it having been in a cluster today, but it's a pretty old system. G star is, is several giga years old. Um, I'll just, since you mentioned it, one thing that's exciting about if it formed that way is the star could conceivably have a planet around it still, which is another thing you can measure along with looking for a binary black hole. So, so Karim, early in your talk you showed an example where Gaia said, you know, great binary, and then right. your data was completely in conflict. So does Gaia just give you the orbit, or does it give some error bars? It gives you error bars. Uh, in that case, was it? In that case, the error bars are small. So there's, you know, it says the solution is good, but there's just something that's gone catastrophically wrong. What could it be? I, well, I think when you fit millions of sources, I think anything can go wrong. I think the most common uh, failure mode is sort of marginally resolved binaries, like 0.1 arc seconds apart, which Gaia sees as a single source, but it's distorted. And so when it looks at different, at it at long different angles, at different scans, it gets astrometry that won't always look like a black hole companion, but in some cases it just happens to. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, it doesn't bother you that the uh, orbital time is comparable to the Earth around the Sun. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny thing. So this solution was thrown out by the Gaia team uh, and by the other papers that looked because it's both close to half a year and close to three times the precession period. So if I only had Gaia, I would say, no way, it's obviously wrong. But I have radial velocities. I can throw out Gaia completely and just fit the radial velocities. And I get the same period. And I get a minimum companion mass only from radial velocities if it were edge-on of like five solar masses. So if there were five solar mass star there, it would be 500 times brighter than the star I actually see. The other thing is we don't know wind coming from the sun. It's 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year. Does that give enough luminosity for us to see it in x-rays or anything? Yeah, we hope so. So we're, today we're submitting a VLA. Uh, follow-up proposal, uh, and, and the same for Chandra. Uh, it, it depends a lot on on what you expect accretion to look like in this very, you know, it's like 10 to the minus 10 Eddington. 
Uh, so if we if I just take Ramesh's standard models, I probably won't see it. But you know, I'm those models aren't tested super well at ten to the minus ten Eddington, so maybe we will. Let's thank uh, Corinne again. So I'm here to, I'm Jeremy, I'm from the University of Arizona. Um, I'm here to give a talk about the uh, transit survey that we just put, put, or in, submitted our results for uh, the nearby late M dwarfs in the northern hemisphere. Why M dwarfs? Well, when you're looking for transit, transiting planets, if you're looking for the Earth around the sun, you can barely tell it's even there at all. You know, there's a very low dip in the transit. If you're looking for Jupiter, obviously you're going to see it very easily, but uh, you know the Earth around the Sun is very hard to detect. However, if you decide to look for the Earth around an M dwarf star, you're going to get a much bigger dip. And so this is the sort of thing that we're looking for, right? Like you're looking for these, that's where you, the highest sensitivity to Earth-sized planets is, is around these small stars. And so the smaller you go, the bigger the, the dip is, the you know more sensitive you'll be to the smaller planets, these rocky type planets. Another thing is, obviously, you know, you can see the just here that the sizes of these planetary systems tend to be, you know, much more compact, right? And so, for Trappist one, everything in, in the entire all seven planets in the Trappist one system fit well within the orbit of Mercury. So you're going to get a lot more observations of these planets, lots more uh, transiting observations you get when you have these uh, smaller sister systems and smaller stars. So. You want to search for transiting planets around the smallest and coolest stars. You can get the most amount of transit observations. You get the most amount of uh, sensitivity. So, you know, that's that's where the, the entire goal for this uh, project was. So we're doing uh, a transit survey monitoring um, nearby late M dwarfs. Um, so specifically looking at ultra cool dwarfs, you know, M7 below, um, using uh, one to two meter class telescopes from all over the world. Um, mostly northern hemisphere, actually all northern hemisphere, but we can go a little bit into the south. Um, so these are our, our sites and our telescopes. Um, so we have anywhere from a 0.8 meter in Arizona to the 2.3 meter in Arizona, and then um, one and two meters in uh, Spain and Italy, and then also one in Taiwan as well. So this longitudinal coverage actually can basically give almost 24-hour uh, direct coverage on a, on a target if we wanted to observe, if we get the observing times lined up. That doesn't always happen. Tax are, you know, not always the easiest to work with in that way. But um, we tr try to get uh, as much longitudinal coverage of these targets as possible. So um, TESS, if you look at other separate surveys here, TESS is fully sensitive down to about M4. Um, it's actually very good at getting stars M4, but they're almost blind beyond M7. So if you look here, right, like this is a, a plot of the known planets and candidates from uh, TESS, the TY values. Uh, you know, they're very good down to M4. You get some from M4 to M7, but there's literally basically nothing beyond uh, at M7 or later um, for, for tests. Um, there are a few candidate stars, uh, you know, like low signal detection things that are not classified as TOIs, but nothing that actually made it past the vetting that is a, uh, in between M7 and M9. And that's where we want to search. We're looking in that area. We're looking between M7, M9, or L0 and trying to find these planets around these really the smallest and coolest stars. So obviously here there's also Mirth. Mirth does a lot of mid M dwarfs. You know their discoveries are mostly around M two to M six stars. So we're actually complementing them by pushing a little bit further, a little bit cooler, 
Um, we have a little bit bigger telescopes, so it's a little bit easier for us to get to those fainter uh, stars. And then with Speculos, um, they are also doing something very similar um, to what we do, but they're mostly operating in the south right now. They have a lot of uh, one meter robotic telescopes there. They are pushing into the north, so our targets are starting to overlap, but right now the complementarity still matches with the targets that we've been using. So uh, our initial target selections were between M4 to L2. We had just this huge data set. We were just looking at, you know, from the peak of the star formation or the star mass uh, thing down. Um, and then distance of 25 parsecs or less and observable at all for, you know, even an hour from the northern hemisphere target uh, telescopes we have. So something even just as from the Lulin telescope in Taiwan, if it's observable at all, put it on the list. But in order to actually get a cut for the survey, we then narrowed it down much narrower to M7 to L0, L0 versus M9, very difficult to distinguish for some of those. Um, our distance was 15 parsecs or less, and make sure it was north of minus 20 declination so we could observe it for at least three hours a night. Um, so this is what ends up happening when you do that. <laughs> you get a very large subset of, um, of targets. This one actually is our 20 parsec sample, but you can cut it down to 15. It actually gets a little less than that too but there's still a large number of targets you can look for. Um, so then what we ended up having to do was to make sure it, it easier for us to actually observe targets that would be uh, not contaminated or um, difficult to catch transits. We removed known binaries, which there were quite a few. Um, active flare stars, again, quite a few, although we did observe some of those in an auxiliary uh, component. And then we went for, we took out stars that are fainter than uh, 15th magnitude in I or 13th magnitude roughly or so in J, uh, J band, because um, the amount of uh, expo exposure time on those targets would actually have been a little bit longer than we uh, would have liked per exposure. So we tried to average about 30 to 60 seconds per exposure on these one to two minute, um, one to two meter telescopes. Uh, basically, we're trying to get the, a good time uh, balance between, you know, cadence, but also, you know, not going too deep on the brighter targets, but being able to see the fainter targets. Um, sometimes we go up out to 90 seconds or so, but we're just trying to get a, that, that good balance for that. Um, we use a long pass filter again to help with getting that sort of, you know, longer, uh, more photons at those fainter targets. Um, but when we have bright moon, that's a real big problem. We don't always get, you know, dark nights. So we try to use a, we use a narrow band there if we can. Our average seeing is not amazing, but we have seen sub, uh, sub arc second seeing before, but we've also seen greater than two. It depends on what happens and we're there. And then we get uh, about four millimag uh, average light curve scatter. Um, so here's one of our good nights. Um, this was from the Colorado Alto Telescope. This is not necessarily the best. I just happened to pick a night that was there and it's like, okay, 1.4 mill to 2 millimag scatter. Um, so there's, you know, nothing really there. And that's going to get to that in a bit. But this is just to show you that we are, you know, very precise, very um, low scatter on our light curves. And this is a map of all the targets we've observed, uh, with specifically with the, the, the survey. Um, and you can, based on the amount of time we spent on each target. So there's a couple of them that we spent a lot of time on. Uh, the different colors uh, basically are the amount of total exposure time uh, versus if you've got three plus continuous hours of time. Uh, the difference we, we say for that specifically is because of uh, our observing strategy. We try to basically get at least three hours on a target on any given night because uh, the transits we're looking for tend to be about an hour long, and so you want to get a little bit of time on each side of the baseline. Um, we try to get at least 25 hours on each, on each of the targets in our survey sample, which is going to be a majority of the upper half of this. Again, some of these were observed for other purposes or um, in the testing services at the start of the survey. Um, but this is the actual subset of targets we ended up observing for the paper for the survey. So everything is between M7 and L0, between 5.7 and 14. Uh, 7-ish, 14.8 uh, parsecs away. Um, and uh, yeah, so we got anywhere between 27 and 411 hours on these targets. So yeah, uh, this is ended up being what was over 500 nights, uh, 2,500 total hours um, and on 22 total stars. Um, and we found that from our survey, we had a high sensitivity to short period planets. So we're looking at mini Neptunes and, and Anything above that, obviously, we also would have seen uh, even greater sensitivity, but 
uh, greater than 50% for mini Neptunes within two days and 80% for mini Neptunes within one day. And we can actually get down to Earth and super Earth size within one day as well. Um, there was no robust transiting planet candidates detected, though. There was one potential vetted and excluded, and I'll get to that in a second. But we, of those 22 stars, there wasn't one confident detection of a transiting planet candidate. But this is our average sensitivity across the entire sample. Um, so we can get up to, again, like roughly 80%, um, above 80% for the mini Neptunes. But the problem is, that's the sensitivity for transiting planets. If you have to look for the de actual detection rate, then you're at the mercy of the inclination of the system. You just can't catch all the planets because not all of them are going to transit. Most of them actually are not going to transit. And even for these small stars and planets close orbits, the uh, transiting inclination limit is still very much driving down our potential detection uh, character you know, ability. So we actually have, a, you know, just happens to be that that's a limiting factor for, this, for the, these blind transit survey types. So we had one uh, potential transit candidate. It's an 8.5 uh, star at 10.3 parsecs. Multiple transit-like potential transit-like events. Um, so this one's a, it's actually a little bit misaligned, but it's about 0.33, 0.34. Then there was this one here. They're all V-shaped, so potential understanding of that, but um, one there as well. I'll just say, yeah, we matched those within minutes, but unfortunately, uh, we followed up. No observation, no no transit. And when we read reduce the data, we actually lose one of the transit events but keep one of them, and so we have no idea what happened. It just It's potentially one single transit, but we don't know anything else about the system. It just is, no, there's no evidence for anything else from the follow-up. And so I'll leave my summary slide and take questions. Just a rough estimate of the radius of the star divided by the orbital yeah. separation, then it gives you a sense of how many stars you need to monitor before you have this chance of seeing it in front of the star. And, and don't you need thousands? You would need a lot, yeah. yeah. So this was, we were hoping we wouldn't necessarily need to, to have that if we were looking for um, you know, these, these planets around the closest nearby stars. We're hoping that. You know, we get luckily in, in some of them. Um, you know, similar to how Trappist one was found, I guess. But uh, yeah, you know, in this case, it was not necessarily thousands, but definitely probably hundreds would be would have would have been better. Um, but you know, we're trying to get as much time as we can on each of these stars and, and have these precise light curves and ability to follow up on them if need be. So that's why we we had that trade off between number of targets and um, hours observed for each one. Questions or comments? Um, you said the nearest object is 5.7 plus 6 away, is that right? The nearest object in our sample, that's a quiescent single uh, northern late M dwarf of seven, M7 to L0. Yes. It's very far in the sense, you know, Alpha Centauri is a far sec away. Wouldn't I expect a zillion M stars within a few far seconds? Yes, and there are uh, higher uh, spectral type M stars that are closer, uh, and there's a lot of you know binary stars that are, are closer as well. Um, but actually, the, so the the it's expected that the stellar uh, mass function turns over around M4, M5. Oh, okay, so you're already really declining yeah. M7 to M9. Yeah, so we're already starting to decline pretty heavily there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. So I know that you said that you selected for quiescent stars, but did you see any interesting activity or flares or something like that? Yeah, there was a, a couple of stars actually had some interesting flares. Um, and we had an auxiliary component paper uh, come out from our uh, Taiwan collaborators as part of the group that uh, measured the uh, flaring rates of Wolf 359. And we actually found that we were uh, much more sensitive to the low, lower luminosity flares. We were laid down to an order of magnitude lower in, in energy than uh, previous results on, on that star. And then there's always, you know, e even some of the stars we observed had some flares. Um, you know, we, we tried to remove all the ones that were known to be very active, and there was one target star that we ended up, uh, or like preliminary target star that we were, when we were trying to observe it, realized was too uh, flare-y. But um, there's still some that even for the quiet stars, they're like, oh, hey, that's a nice 10% flare. That's a nice 5% flare. 
So we see some of those still in the, in the data. OK, let's thank uh, Jeremy. I'm Nathan Sanford. I'm a final year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm excited to be here and talking to you about some of my recent work on um, pushing how far we can measure stellar chemistry. Um, so upcoming wide area imaging surveys, like on the Rubin, uh, of the Vera Rubin Observatory and the Roman Space Telescope, have the potential to discover hundreds of stellar streams and low mass galaxies throughout the, the local group and out to uh, several megaparsecs. Um, and not only discover them, but uh, observe resolve, their resolved stellar populations. Um, but to fully unlock the scientific potential of these new discoveries, um, we need to pair these ambitious photometric surveys with equally ambitious spectroscopic surveys. Um, spectroscopic follow-up of these resolved stellar populations are important because it you know, not only provides us with the radial velocities, which we can use to um, infer kinematic and orbital information, but also chemical abundances. Um, iron abundances, alpha enhancements, and in many cases also a handful to uh, a dozen uh, individual elemental abundances. And these measurements can be used for a whole slew of interesting uh, scientific endeavors um, from you know, the discovery and membership determinations of these systems to their classification and characterization. And of course, their chemical composition tells us a lot about um, the chemical enrichment history and the galaxy evolution of, of these low mass faint systems, which are you know, some of the, the lowest mass, lowest metallicity, oldest um, systems in the universe. Um, fortunately, we're in a really exciting time for stellar spectroscopy. And by the 2030s, large, highly multiplex spectro uh, spectroscopic surveys will acquire spectra for upwards of 50 million stars throughout the Milky Way and local group. And this is, of course, complemented by targeted follow up campaigns with larger telescopes like Keck and the VLT, and of course also um, JWC and, and 30 meter class telescopes as well. Um, but something I want to point out here is that uh, roughly 75% of these 50 million-ish spectra will be acquired at low resolution, at R of less than 10,000. Um, and as we go out to larger and larger distances, out beyond 100 kiloparsec or so, the fraction of low resolution spectra increases to order unity just out of observational necessity. Um, and so to prepare ourselves for this wealth of data that we will be collecting, it's really important for us to understand um, what we can measure from these low resolution spectra um, and how, well, how much we should trust these measurements as well um, if we're to put all of these uh, surveys on, on even playing ground. Right? In an ideal case, we go and get high resolution spectra at high signal to noise for all of the stars we could ever want. But this isn't really possible because high resolution spectra is is pretty expensive um, due to low throughput, um, high dispersion, and in many cases, uh, poor multiplexing as well. And so as we go beyond the Milky Way, this is really limited to the, the brightest stars in nearby satellites. So what we have to do is we have to go to lower resolution. And when we go to lower resolution, we get higher signal-to-noise observations. Um, but you can see that this is traded off by with uh, the, uh, the resolving power, obviously. We can no longer. Uh, isolate individual lines like we could with high resolution spectra. Instead, those, those beautiful isolated lines are now blended with their neighboring lines. Um, and what we, uh, you know, this isn't the, the end of the world. We can handle this, but we have to fit the whole spectrum si simultaneously, fit all of the abundances together. Um, and so uh, the question here is what chemical information still, still remains at low resolution? Um, we can quantify this using Kramer Al Lower Bounds, which is a statistical tool um, based off of the Fisher Information Matrix. It uh, just efficiently approximates the, the expected statistical precision of a set of observations. It's used extensively in cosmological forecasting, and recently we've been applying it to stellar spectroscopy as well. Um, and for stellar spectra, it, it incorporates all of the things that you would expect it to. Um, wavelength coverage, spectral resolution, the signal-to-noise, 
um, how strongly varying spectral features are with the, the chemical composition of stellar atmospheres. Right? And so we can apply this, and we have, to upcoming instruments. Like, for example, here I look at the, the mosaic low-resolution spectrograph on the EELT, um, but forecasts for the GMT and TMT are, are, are quite similar. Um, and what I've plotted here on the x-axis is the apparent magnitude of a star, or equivalently, the distance to that star. And on the, the y-axis is the forecasted precision. And here I just show a few uh, elemental abundances. Um, and at the, you know, about 0.8 megaparsecs, distance of M31, uh, we're forecasting that iron and alpha abundances should be measured to the 0.01 dex level and, a, you know, a handful of other elements to the 0.1 dex level. And as we push out to 3 megaparsecs, when we start to actually be able to access stars in nearby other galaxy groups outside of the local group, um, we're forecasting precisions for iron and alpha around 0.1 dex and other elements to closer to 0.3 dex. And to put this in context, um, the forecast for pre predicting at M31 is currently what's achievable by uh, surveys like Apogee and Galah within the Milky Way. Um, but now we're doing this in M31. Um, and uh, at the distances of about 3 megaparsecs, this is more or less the precision that's currently achievable for uh, Milky Way satellite galaxies and maybe M31 satellite galaxies. So uh, even at low resolution, we think we should be able to pr uh, measure detailed chemical abundance measurements out throughout the local group and into the local volume. But if you've worked with stellar spectra at all, you know that um, you might be thinking that this is a little optimistic, and I think um, there's reason to be skeptical, right? These forecasts are for precision only, um, and achieving accurate abundances um, which is, you know, perhaps more important than precise abundances, um, relies on the fidelity of our spectral models, right? If we go back and look at our low-resolution spectrum example, you could imagine the case in which one of these lines was poorly calibrated or misplaced. Um, at high resolution, you just ignore that line. But at low resolution, it bleeds into adjacent lines, and it becomes inseparable. And so you can imagine that biases might be introduced as you go to lower resolution. So to quantify uh, the, the effects of going to lower resolution, I turned to the Keck archive, where I found some just beautifully exquisite high-res spectra in the M15 globular cluster with high signal-to-noise and resolutions as high as R of 80,000. Um, and the reason that you want to go, uh, that we found spectra that was this beautiful was that it gave us lots of room to make it look less beautiful. We could uh, specifically take this uh, high resolution spectra and convolve it down to lower and lower resolutions. Um, and at each one of these resolutions, I fit the full spectrum uh, for nearly 40 elemental abundances, your handful of stellar parameters, and, and all sorts of continuum nuisance parameters. Um, and by doing this entirely self consistently at each resolution and comparing the abundances we measure at lower resolution to the ones we do at higher resolution, we can quantify both a systematic bias and a systematic uncertainty. And here I show what we find for iron. And for iron, uh, we find quite small systematics of the order 0.01 dex. And unless you're doing really high precision nuclear synthesis, um, you know, but uh, this is totally fine. And especially for extragalactic um, chemical evolution studies, we'd be quite happy with 0.01 dex precision. Um, and this shouldn't be particularly surprising. We've been measuring iron abundances from low resolution spectra and even photometry for decades now, but this is just a good um, reassuring check on that. Um, and what's also good is that we find for many elements, um, we, we also see very low biases with resolution and only small to modest 0.1 to 0.2 dex systematic uncertainties. I just show a few examples here. Um, but of course, with the good comes the bad. Um, and there are some elements that we find show very strong biases um, or very large systematic uncertainties that would make them difficult to, to work with um, in, in, in terms of putting them on the same uh, standing as high resolution studies. Um, and in most cases, we find that these are, in fact, the result of model data mismatches that get blended and exacerbated as you go to lower resolution. So what do you make of this? Well, whether you find this reassuring or disheartening depends, of course, on the specific abundances that you want. If you only care about iron, this is pretty good. But if you care about silicon, maybe less so. Um, I'm personally quite reassured that for more than a handful of elements, we're finding that robust abundances can be measured down to R of 2,500. Um, and it's also always good to know which elements to be more cautious of and which elements need more careful treatment. 
Um, so I want to conclude by just showing this forecast uh, that I showed earlier. Um, and just folding in those systematic uncertainties. And for the ones shown here, you can see that, okay, maybe maybe we can't get, you know, point, uh, less than 0.1 dex precision for, for uh, a, a, a number of elements um, at, M, you know, the distance of M31. But for the most part, at the precision that we'll be working with for low resolution chemical abundances um, outside of the, the Milky Way and, and local group, um, it should be still relatively um, promising. So just to flash up my conclusions, um, I've quantified uh, low resolution systematic uncertainties and biases um, using Keck high res spectra. Um, many elements are good, some elements are bad. Um, and ultimately, we should be um, quite excited for the future of, of low resolution spectroscopy um, and its ability to measure precise multi-element abundance patterns um, out to large distances. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, uh, can you just say a few words about the science uh, that can be done with those measurements in the sense of perhaps some dating of how different ga when different galaxies made their stars, or is there any, I mean, anything cosmological that we can learn from that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I wish I had more time to, to fold in some of those things as well, just some of those motivations. Um, recently, I've been working um, on the a chemical evolution of an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy, Eridanus II. Um, and what we're finding is that with, even with just iron abundances, we're able to place better constraints on the uh, time scale of star formation than you can from uh, kind of cla just traditional CMD fitting um, that is being done. There just there's a higher time resolution when you factor in elemental enrichment as well. Um, so that's one example. And you can constrain things like outflows um, of these galaxies um, in, in the pre-reionization era um, as well. Yeah, our sister galaxy, Andromeda, seems to be quite similar to our own Milky Way, so that will allow us to say how, how different they are. Yeah, so there, it's really exciting. There's not one, but two JWST Cycle 1 proposals to go get um, abundances in the M31 disk. And um, I, that will be really interesting to see if M31 has a similar alpha enhancement by modality as the Milky Way. Um, we know that M31's accretion history is quite different from the, the Milky Way. So, you know, does that leave a, a, a detectable chemical signature in the stars would be also very interesting to learn. Yes, please. So for your uh, elements that have larger systematic problems, is that motivating just getting better atomic data and better models for those lines, or is there something more pathological going on with like, specific features that are getting blended more easily? So I think in general, I mean, it comes down to um, our, our line lists and also treatment of non-LTE um, 3D effects as well. So I think as our models get better, and they are, and they will continue to, those systematics should shrink. I don't think there's anything pathological ab about them. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you mentioned all of these new um, uh, wide field surveys that will be you know, finding more of these streams, you know, and something like Roman Space Telescope is also going to find things further out in the infrared, which hasn't been possible, and, and we can hope that maybe something the UV will turn up uh, sometime in the next decade. So is there any scope of using the photometric information, especially in the UV where all of the metals kick in, to, uh, to improve on some of these measurements when you combine with spectroscopy? Yeah, so I think... Um, the, uh, if you can get, if, if the photometry helps, say, place um, stars on, uh, in, in temperature, surface gravity space, that helps out a lot, because spectra themselves um, has that information, but it's, it's more subject to other systematic effects. And so if you can pin those down from photometry, that helps you do your precision a whole lot. Yes, how, um, so for your example spectra, I think you said M is it M15 and you took the, mm -hmm. uh, how covariant are your precision measurements with the, like the absolute iron abundance, for instance, would you do better if you went to more metal rich stars or? Yeah, this is a really interesting question, which unfortunately is hard to answer when you have a monometallic sample size. Um, and the reason I chose M15 is because, you know, I'm interested in these uh, low metallicity galaxies that we're going to be looking at. Um, I think it is an interesting question that I don't, I, I could go see either direction being um, 
true that if you went to higher metallicities, you have more lines, and so there's a lot more room for blending and things get messier. I can also imagine that as you go to higher metallicity, it's easier to constrain certain elements, and that uh, should kind of dominate over you know, systematic effects on, for individual lines. So I don't know, but that's a good question. Well, we need to move on. Let's take the next. Yeah, so after this nice talk about the stellar chemistry, I feel like we are 100 years behind. So I want to tell you about you know, exoplanetary chemistry, um, the very tip of the iceberg, because uh, we were hoping to have some more papers out by now, but the second paper only got submitted last night. Um, so, what? Sorry, this is jumping by a lot. Um, all right. This is interesting. There you go. So I was preparing this talk and I, you know, I had my son Alex, who is eight years old now, say, Mom, I have it, too many marbles now. What do I do? And in, you know, in the case of exoplanets, it's kind of the same thing. Like we have about 5,000 planets confirmed and you know, it's about time to do something else with them. Um, so, one idea, I mean, obviously, with the number of planets that we have now, you know, we have a range of sizes, densities, temperatures, uh, you know, environments where the planets are living. So, so we can basically start doing more things, right? We can start, you know, explaining how planets form and evolve. Um, we can start telling what they are made of. And we can even start telling you, you know, what is the diversity of exoplanets in, term, uh, in terms of both physical and chemical properties. So in a nutshell, exoplanet is now where stellar astrophysics was 100 years ago. You know, when Cecilia Payne finally figured out what all those little depths in the spectrum meant, and that was a signature of what the chemical composition of the stars are, this is where exoplanets uh, is right now. So as many of you know, but I wanted to give you um, a little overview of like how do we measure exoplanet chemistry. Like, you know, that is basically done via the atmospheres. And there is two ways to do this. One of them is direct imaging, which you have heard me a thousand times telling you these things. You know, in that case, it's easy because you just block the light from the star, you put a slate on top of the planet directly, you get a spectrum, and you know what the, what the planet is made of. On the other hand, you have transits, which are the ones that we are doing right now because that's where our technology is, and we have a lot of transiting planets. And in that case, the way we measure the spectra of planets when we're using transits is a little bit more complicated and I'm trying to show you here exactly how it is so you can understand where we are going at the end. So we basically have three ways of doing this. One of them is when the planet goes in front of the star and we look at the light that goes through the atmosphere. Another one is when the planet goes behind the star so we basically look at the emission from the planet itself. And a third way is just to monitor the system as the planet goes around and what you do in that case is you can map you know, like all the phases of the planet, and you can look at things like changes in temperature, changes in chemistry, and so on. So, just so you understand how we do this with transiting planets a little bit better, we basically, you know, we take spectra over long periods of time, you know, five, six hours, and then we take each one of those spectra and we bin it in different wavelengths, ch chunks, and we plot the different transits at different colors. And what we look for is basically the same as stellar astrophysics, right? It's just you look for at what wavelengths the opacity of the atmosphere of the planet changes. And a change in opacity means that the planet looks bigger or smaller. So this is fairly trivial, except that, as you see here, the depth of the transits for a Jupiter, that's about 1%, and the depth of those changes in the depth, or, you know, the, the amplitude of the changes in the depth of the transits that we're looking for are of the order of fractions of a 1%. So, for years, I spent like two thirds of my career scratching my head with systematics. And these three plots that I show you here are state-of-the-art data from the ground, Hubble, and Spitzer. 
So as you can imagine, the systematics, because we're working like at the limit of detection of instruments that were not built for this, the systematics are a lot larger than the actual signals of the atmospheres. And this is where we have been spending 90% of our time for the last 15 years. With James Webb, we did not know what was coming up. So we got ready. This is the data that we have been collecting, as I said, over the last 15 years. And we have, we have done fairly well. But as you can tell, you know, the data are the points, the models are the lines. We have three to five sigma detections on things like sodium, water, but we really needed to do better. So in 2015, the exoplanet atmosphere community, or a large, a large fraction of it, got together because we were panicking. We were saying, you know, if it has taken us 12 to 15 years to figure out the systematics of these instruments, and James Webb only has fuel at the time, we didn't know, for 10 years, it's going to take us 10 years to figure out the systematics. What are we going to do? So we basically got together and, we, you know, we gathered about 100 people. Now we have about 350, but, you know, about 100 people active. And we put together uh, this, this project, um, you know, with PIs, COIs, Science Council, and basically three main ideas. And also a data challenge um, group that what we did for years, I was leaving that, what we did for years was to prepare for James Webb. And we submitted a proposal, a director's discretionary time, early release science proposal, and we got 78 hours of telescope time to do three planets uh, with five different instruments. That was initially proposed, uh, that instrument mode, but then we, we changed that to near spec prism that covers the full wavelength range. That was a blessing because that's our first result. Um, the three science projects. So you see what is coming. We're not there yet, but papers are coming out. We have three science projects on the ERS team, uh, project itself. The first one is a pan panchromatic exoplanet transmission spectrum of a whole Jupiter. And the idea there is to get a full spectrum from 0.6 to 5 microns, where we can see all these atmospheric features continuously and at very high precision. And the science behind it is to be able to constrain the metallicity of the planet and constrain the CO ratio, which I will explain later a little bit why that is important. And here in the simulations, you see red was the constraints on those parameters that Hubble was giving us, and blue are the constraints that we, are, or that we were hoping that James Webb was going to give us. The second science case is a lot more exciting, in my opinion. Um, it's basically a, a full phase curve of a planet. I mean, this is like 24 hours continuously um, taking data on this target. And the idea here is to uh, basically look at um, the, the chemical properties and the temperature properties, basically the climate of a planet over a whole, like over the whole surface. Um, and basically try to figure out, you know, like how the clouds are distributed, uh, what, the what, what, what the chemistry of those clouds are, and also what the chemistry of the planet in different you know, parts of the planet, like the day side, the night side, and so on, are. And finally, the third science case is that, well, this is twofold. This idea is twofold. Um, it's to measure an emission spectrum, which is when the planet goes behind the star, again, of a hot Jupiter. And the idea here is, for the first time, to figure out what are the temperature pressure profiles of, of exoplanet atmosphere, like, like at least Jupiter atmospheres, and especially if they have thermal inversion layers and things like that, because that is one parameter that so far we just have to fit it to the models. We don't know how that temperature pressure structure looks like. And the second goal in this is that this is a very bright target, so we are trying to get to the bottom. We are trying to get to the noise baseline of JWST to basically say, you know, can we ever measure the atmosphere of an Earth. You know, if the noise baseline of JWST is too high, it doesn't matter if we take a thousand transiting planets of an exo-Earth, we will never get there. Um, so that is to be determined. Okay, so these are all the plans. And then, you know, we were ready, pipelines ready, everything ready, and we were staring into the blank, waiting for James Webb to get the first data set. And the first data set arrived on July 14, um, two days after, you know, the big press release images and so on. We're ready, we jumped in, 24 hours running pipelines, and after 24 hours, I'll show you what we first saw. This is just the first thing we saw. 
no detrending, no systematics. Well, I'm lying. There's a little bit of a trend in time. 21,000 data points, one data point per second. That was just easy peasy. So just so you see where we are right now. Then, you know, we went ahead. We took those data. We bin it. And what you see here is basically uh, an animation of the transit depth changes for 97 uh, different bins in wavelength. We had never seen this before. Like, you see the changes in the transit depth by eye. Just look at it. Whoop, there you go. And then we took that. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, and so it's basically the same plot, change in transit depth, as a function of wavelength. Gosh, I need two minutes. And um, <laughs> as a function of wavelength, um, and then, so this is for four different pipelines. Like our pipeline here at the CFA, so Star Wars fans, pay attention. Our pipeline is Tiberius, and it was written by James Carrick. So, but you basically see that um, all the pipelines agree. Like everything is agreeing, and you see a number of features, like you see a little bit of a slope there. You see a jump in there at four microns. You see a big jump there at 4.3 microns, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So what I'm going to show you here, uh, this is the first paper that we got out. This was um, a space telescope coming after us, going like, oh, come on, guys, what you got, what you got? So we, got, we put this paper together. Basically, what you see here is um, you know, a number of models with different molecules. And we put molecules in and out. We put clouds in and out. And basically, what we have found, oh, yeah, and this, these are all thermal, uh, thermodynamical equilibrium models. And we find that there's a very clear signal of carbon dioxide. You see that slope in the blue that's basically water vapor. And there's some hints of other things, like carbon monoxide and uh, hydrogen sulfide, no methane. We're not seeing methane anywhere. So the analysis of this data is coming out in more detail um, in four papers. Uh, one of them was submitted to Nature last night. So you will see, you know, I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg here. You will see a lot more coming out. Um, these are the results that are coming out from just the ERS program. Uh, four Nature papers uh, on WASP 39 uh, from four different instruments and different um, uh, resolutions and wavelength coverage and so on. So we basically do like a, we are going to show you a lot of stuff there. Uh, then we have a global uh, atmospheric model study with photochemical models and so on. Uh, an emission spectrum, which is on the making. The phase curve, we haven't gotten the data yet. And then the community, because this is all public data, like anybody can jump in and do stuff. The community uh, is putting forward, at least to my knowledge, 19 ancillary papers. They're Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, but then, just to insist, and this is the end of my talk, tip of the iceberg, right? So we are, what I'm showing you is like all the way up there at the top left corner. These are all the planets with a ready approved time on James Webb. All the way from Jupiter to Earth, lava worlds, sub Neptunes, Neptunes, you name it. Um, we here at the CFA, we're part of, I think it's 27 of those. Um, targets and uh, you know I I can keep coming back giving talks <laughs> because this is gonna be amazing. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you and I'm happy to answer questions. I can okay so I can tell you like those four papers and I think the global circulation model there is a special nature feature, and that right now probably will come up by December. I can give a talk in January if you want. Like, I'm serious. Like, and another point this I is cool. To make is that with LIGO, we had a very similar experience where people for many years uh, designed templates. They said the signal to noise would be of order one. I don't know if you remember that. That was the psychology of the field. They worked very hard making templates. Then, 2015, a huge signal, and yeah. that you didn't need a template. No. So, is your conclusion that the astronomers are too conservative? Um, well, I mean, in this particular case, like, we really, I mean, you mean template, yeah, so... In terms of what to expect from new instruments. Yeah, right, so we were, we were using what was available, right? Right, but you and, expect generally to be as good. 
Right, right. We, I mean, we we were ready. We were like, we really need to beat this because otherwise that thing is going to run out of fuel and we are still trying to figure out the systematics, right? So, but no, it is behaving. It's behaving pretty well. And also, you know, on the science side, I didn't mention it, uh, but there is features here. I mean, I guess that you can see them better here. Like, there is that feature that we, we think we know what it is now. It's in the second paper. There is something else going on there. And there is a slope here going downwards, which could be a systematic of JWST. I have a hard time believing that is. So there's a stuff there that we have been going to Hydran, and they're like, we don't have lining. We don't have any lines in here. We don't know what that is. Um, so there's stuff already coming up that, you know, it's not a systematic from the data analysis. It's actually real physics or real chemistry going on that we don't know. So. So will JWST revisit these systems? Can you look for you know, time changes, crowds, whatever? Yeah, so right now, I, I, I have a feeling that people are going to really like give it as a boring. So I think it's going to be very hard to, put, to get through a proposal like that. But um, yeah, I mean, that would be cool. Variability, yeah, variability is a big deal. Um, I, I'm not aware of any proposals accepted for variability yet. And probably we can do it, but for smaller planets, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's very cool. There is a tendency to associate this with a spectrum, but it's not really a spectrum because the, it depends on the scale height of different. So my point is, for yeah. different wavelengths, you might see different parts of the atmosphere. Yeah, you do. So That's then, right. as a result, it's not really the spectrum. Yeah. Right. Yeah, another thing is that this is, this is inverted. So that peak up there is actually an absorption line. But the way that we measure it is we measure a change in the transit depth. So like the transit depth is getting bigger or deeper. So that is counterintuitive. But you're totally right. What actually what happens is that there is information from the red to the blue on depth in the atmosphere. Like whether um, wavelengths are giving information from deeper in the atmosphere and bluer wavelengths are going up in the atmosphere. So yeah, you're right. So prism must take it at a different time, although it does look weird, it looks different. Okay, it's true. So maybe. Okay, so we have some viability today. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. No, that's a good point, Adam, because we have like, we have four different transits, uh, but they're taking over like a three weeks or something like that, so, but yeah, that's a good, yeah, okay. No paper. I mean, you know, I'm seeing here in paper number 20. No, really? see, it's like, <laughs> actually, that idea is not in there, so. Yeah, and okay. Yeah. Well, let's thank uh, Mercedes. <laughs>